To say that the pace of clinical trials for Parkinson's is pedestrian is to be polite about the systemic problem. The EGAS Act PD initiative demonstrates the complexity of the task of fixing it. We applaud the intentions and commitment of those involved and wish them well. They deserve to be supported. This is Penprig's way of doing so. Right. Uh, hello and good evening or good morning wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Uli Funken and on behalf of Penprig, I'd like to welcome you to today's session on the topic the Edmund J. Safra Initiative for Accelerating Clinical Trials in Parkinson's. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Camille Carroll, Associate Professor in Neurology and Honorary Consultant Neurologist, Plymouth Hospital and NHS Trust. So, Camille, over to you. Thanks, Ali. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and um, talk about this really exciting initiative in, for clinical trials in Parkinson's. And uh, the first test, of course, is to see whether I can um, screen share successfully. So I shall attempt to do that. So welcome, everybody. Really nice uh, to, to see you all, some old friends in the audience. And it's a real pleasure to catch up with you all again. Um, so what I'm going to talk about um, is this initiative, the Edmund J. Safra um, Accelerating Clinical Trials in Parkinson's Initiative. Um, and because I got wind that some of folks uh, attending today might not be from Plymouth or indeed the UK, I thought I'd start with a bit of um, orientation. So Plymouth uh, is set in uh, is the, one of the main towns in Devon um, at the tail end of the UK. Um, but it has had some notable exports over the years. Uh, and here are the Mayflower Steps and, of course, the Pilgrim Fathers set sail from Plymouth. Um, in search of um, the, the, the US. Uh, Francis Drake uh, was a notable character. We have um, Devonport and the dockyards, and this is the old naval base, and of course our excellent uh, Plymouth Gin. But what you might not be so aware of is the link between Plymouth and the first clinical trial or at least one of the first uh, recorded clinical trials. Uh, and this chap is James Lind, um, who served in the Navy in the 1700s. And he documented um, a trial, and I'll come back to that. Um, and the trial that he conducted was, I think, on HMS Salisbury, bound for Plymouth. So what I'm going to talk about today is a bit about trials and why they're hard to do, <coughs> excuse me, and then a bit about why our initiative, the Edmund J. Safra Act PD initiatives, provides uh, an attempt at a solution. This won't be the solution, of course. It's an iteration. It's a journey, and this is a step on the journey. But we believe it's a very important step. Um, and of course, it isn't without its challenges. I'm going to centre this on our vision. So this is a UK wide vision that um, Act PD, EJS Act PD has a place in delivering what we want within the UK, and this is across healthcare generally, not just specific to Parkinson's, is that from the moment of diagnosis, everyone with Parkinson's has the opportunity to take part in a study that answers important questions about their care. And we want that to be irrespective of age, gender, ethnicity, geographical location, or their healthcare provider. And if ever we needed an example of why healthcare research and inclusivity in healthcare research is so important, we need only to think about the COVID pandemic and what's come out of um, the research conducted into COVID uh, and the susceptible groups, and how it's really important that we understand the impact of healthcare and also our um, innovations, our new treatments on those particularly vulnerable groups. Um, and this vision is shared by various um, bodies across the UK. It's part of the NHS constitution. It forms part of the um, CQC framework for inspecting healthcare organisations. It's supported by NIHR, the Clinical Research Network, and also the Royal College of Physicians and other Royal Colleges. So it's within this, this context, this moving forward of the importance of research and really embedding it within healthcare provision that we're launching our initiative. And the reason that I'm making Making this point is to say this isn't an initiative that's working in isolation. This is an initiative that very much sits within this broader context and is landing on fertile ground, if you like. We're pushing on open doors here, and that really helps um, with, with what we hope will be a successful undertaking. So, what do you need for a trial? Um, well, if you think about it, if you're going to conduct a study, what you need is people to take part in that study. You need participants. But <coughs> 
you need to have some sort of intervention or a therapy that you're trialing that you want to test whether it works. You need to have some idea of how you're going to design your study, some uh, concept of what you're going to measure, how you're going to evaluate whether the drug or therapy works in the way that you want it to work. You've got to have infrastructure in place to, in order to deliver your study. And importantly, you have to have a plan for how you're going to get those findings through to impacting healthcare if those findings are beneficial. So let's return to James Lind. Uh, and he conducted uh, a trial looking at scurvy. And scurvy was um, a real cause, cause of um, morbidity uh, in, the, in the Navy in the 1700s um, and earlier. And there was a lot of work done on it on how to prevent it. So James Lind wrote his uh, treatise on the scurvy. It was actually written in three parts. So this particular element is just buried within it, which is part of um, the reason why it didn't initially translate into impact. But what he did on the 20th of May, 1747, he selected 12 patients in the scurvy. He made sure that their cases were as similar as he could have them. They all in general had putrid gums, the spots and lassitude with weakness of their knees, and he controlled their conditions. They all lay together in one place and had one diet common to all. And in actual fact, this very first trial was a multi-arm trial. This was not a single intervention that he was trialing. It was several interventions. And he trialed a quart of cider, drops of elixir vitriol, vinegar, seawater, oranges and lemons, and an electorally recommended by the hospital surgeon. Those were his interventions. And his trial had a positive outcome. So the people on the oranges and lemons being at the end of six days fit for duty. And we could think of this as being an outcome of relevant to patients. This is your patient reported impact on patient lives outcome. But he also had secondary outcomes. The spots were not indeed at that time quite off his body, nor his gums sound. So there were some measures of disease activity, which he also evaluated. However, this did have delayed translation. So lemon juice was not routinely used in the Navy until 1795, which is 47 years after he published that and actually a year after he died. But as soon as it was introduced, of course, scurvy almost completely disappeared from the Navy, but it didn't disappear from land until 100 years later. So it's important that if we are going to do these studies and we have positive findings, that we also plan in our pathways to impact or else we're not really benefiting or maximising the benefit of the studies that we're undertaking. If we think about the trial development uh, journey, uh, back in 1747, we had comparators, we had the idea of inclusion criteria, and we had controlled conditions. And these are some of the building blocks and core aspects of how we still design trials today. However, if we think about disease modifying therapies for Parkinson's disease, and what are our current challenges in trying to design those particular um, trials, then you, you'll soon see that there are some specific um, concepts that I'm just going to talk through now. So in general, tri trials try to measure differences between two groups of people, those who get a therapy and those that don't. Um, so in simple terms, if we have people with Parkinson's here, um, if you receive a treatment which helps your symptoms, hopefully you'll find that your Parkinson's gets better. That's the y-axis. Uh, and then you'll, you'll stay better as that treatment is adjusted uh, and tailored to your symptoms. And if you don't get any treatment for your Parkinson's, then your Parkinson's, as you'll um, all be aware, will gradually uh, progress with time. And you'll experience more in the way of Parkinson's symptoms with time. But what about treatments that aren't geared towards symptoms, but they're target, uh, aimed at reversing, slowing or stopping uh, Parkinson's progression? What would they look like on this graph? Well, if our disease modifying therapy actually reverses Parkinson's, then you'd expect people without treatment to get gradually better with time as their disease is being reversed. If the um, therapy will stop Parkinson's progression, then they'll remain stable over time. And then if it slows Parkinson's progression, they will slowly get worse over time, but not to the same extent as those people who are um, not taking the therapy. So you can see that although the difference between your control group and your treated group might be quite big for people who are getting a symptomatic treatment, 
If it's a disease reversing, stopping or slowing treatment, that might be quite a small difference that we're looking for. And if the, the people with Parkinson's taking part in the study are on treatment, which helps their symptoms, then you can see that that becomes even more difficult to detect. So detecting disease modifying therapy benefits is much harder than detecting symptomatic benefits. And of course, there are additional challenges, some of which I'll come back to. So how long do we um, uh, have people in the study in order to detect the differences? And you can see that for most of these, the longer we run the study, the bigger the difference will become a, a apparent. Um, some aspects of Parkinson's might change more quickly than others, and that might be different in different groups of people. So how do we select what to measure? And if we um, think about who's going to take part in the study, if we take people who are very uh, different at baseline, so if they're at different points on this y-axis, even at the start of the study, then that, of, of course, will also impact the, our ability to, to detect a difference at the end of the study. So all of these are challenges um, specific to Parkinson's. When we do studies, uh, we generally think of them being conducted in several phases. So the preclinical phase is the laboratory work, particularly looking um, at animal models or cell culture work to identify therapies for slowing Parkinson's that might work um, based on these preliminary experiments in the laboratory. The next phase of the study is called phase one, and that's taking a drug which has never been taken before by human beings and doing what's called first in man studies, checking that it's safe, not throwing up any um, anything unexpected. Um, uh, and these are the sort of early phase studies, which are very niche, involve a very small number of people. Um, and the, this would generally take um, a few months to a year or so. The studies that we're interested in are these studies, phase two and phase three studies. So these are, these are drugs um, which might already be used for other conditions or an, a new drugs, but shown to be safe in people. What we want to see is there any signal at all that this works in Parkinson's, that's a phase two. And then if there is a signal that this might work in Parkinson's to slow disease progression, we need to repeat that in, in many more people, generally over many sites, sometimes many countries, and that's a phase three study. And if the drug is shown to be of benefit at this point, that's when it will become approved by the regulators in order for us to be able to prescribe it potentially. These phase two and phase three studies each take maybe up to five years to run. Um, so you can see that this pipeline of drug development is actually pretty slow coming from a, a, a laboratory idea through to something that might be approved by the regulators. And if we look at the, the track record of this in Parkinson's, because of course there's been a lot of activity in Parkinson's for the last 20 years, looking at various drugs which might slow, stop or reverse Parkinson's. The brown boxes are those phase two studies. Is there any signal? The, the yellow boxes are those bigger phase three studies. And you can see that not a single one has shown a, a benefit in Parkinson's in a way that has allowed it to be um, prescribed for protection in Parkinson's. So we've got a problem. It's not lack of activity. It's that whatever we're doing isn't working. So what, what is the problem? Is it that we are not choosing the right people to take part in the studies? Is it that the drugs uh, have been poorly selected or the wrong, the wrong drugs? Is it that our trial design um, wasn't correct? Is it that we're measuring the wrong thing, that we can't actually measure how Parkinson's is progressing? Maybe we don't have the right processes or infrastructure in place. Um, and always remembering that we do need to build in that pathway to impact if we do have a, have a drug which seems to be working. So I thought I'd put in here a quote from Ben Stetcher, who very eloquently in uh, 2018 wrote about some of the frustrations felt by people with Parkinson's, particularly given the amount of activity that there is looking for a cure. We remain hopeful that the whirlwind of research and translational studies which flood the pages of journals around the world will result in treatments that significantly improve quality of life for people with Parkinson's within our lifetime. While the Parkinson's community continues to wait, however, we must acknowledge a growing element of scepticism. The pace of novel advances seems to be slowed down by a system that cannot move fast enough to keep up with our own neurodegeneration. And I thought that's quite a powerful way of expressing frustration. It's very slow. What we do is very slow and it isn't working anyway. So we need to change something. And that's where our initiative um, comes in. And what we're planning to do is 
change the way that we deliver the trial structure to make it more efficient by conducting what is known as a multi-arm, multi-stage trial. So you'll have um, seen from the previous um, graph, I'll just flick back to, that each, each of these um, phase two studies followed by a phase three study, followed by maybe currently or followed by a different study, each of these are individual studies and each of these is taking years and years and years. How about we put those all on one platform and run them at the same time? So with a multi-arm study, we can actually um, investigate uh, different drugs in this cartoon. There are four different drugs that we're evaluating. And instead of doing that phase two study, looking at the results, getting the funding for phase three, and then running the phase three, what we can do is we can set off as if we're going to run the phase three study and just make sure that we have a really clear go, no go checkpoint so that if a treatment clearly isn't going to work, we ditch it early and we bring in an alternative treatment instead. And that way, hopefully the whole thing can be a lot more um, efficient. And you can see in this infographic, that at the end of five years, when ordinarily we'd have completed one phase two study, in this particular scenario, we've completed um, six phase two studies and one phase three. So it is a lot more efficient. And this method of trial delivery, this design has been very successfully employed across different disease areas, most notably several cancers, uh, but also now being um, taken up in other neurodegenerative conditions, um, motor neuron disease with MND smart and multiple sclerosis with octopus. So we've been very um, fortunate uh, to receive funding from Edmund J. Safra, um, foundation to develop this platform for Parkinson's, for neuroprotective treatments in Parkinson's, so that we can hopefully um, deliver clinical trials much more efficiently and at scale. And in order to do this, we've consulted with um, people who've got experience of this uh, in other disease areas that I've just alluded to. Uh, we, we are conducting a scoping review of all the neuroprotective trials which are in the literature to see what we can learn from them. Uh, and we also undertook a Delphi process to understand what is important to people conducting trials, but also really importantly, what matters to people with Parkinson's and their care partners thinking about protective treatments for Parkinson's. And to deliver or create the platform, we've set up various working groups and what we're going to end up with is a trial protocol, which will allow us to launch the first MAMS trial. Just to tell you quickly about um, a Delphi process, because I'm going to touch on some of the findings. So the um, at what a Delphi process is, it is it's um, asking people several questions repeatedly, um, people representing different groups, and then feeding back the responses so that at the beginning with the first survey round, all those responses will be quite disparate. But then as you feed back the responses of the different groups, you can start to mould people's opinions and they can um, change maybe their viewpoint based on the feedback of others and hopefully achieve consensus over, uh, in this case, three rounds. And the Ardelphi process, we included people with Parkinson's, their care partners, uh, clinical scientists, funders, uh, the industry and the regulators. And what we attempted to do was come to an agreement of how such a clinical trial should be designed, work out where there was agreement and also importantly, work out where more discussion was needed. So this is our consortium. Uh, this is what we've just launched. Um, the consortium is, is led by uh, myself together with the team at UCL, Professor uh, Thomas Faltony and Sonia Gandhi. Um, uh, and as you can see from the various logos there, we, this is very much a collaborative effort with um, UC, the UCL team and also importantly, um, the MRC Clinical Trials Unit, which is based at UC, UCL and the Movement Disorder Centre based at um, Queen Square. Um, and what we've done is we've set up six working groups broadly mapping to these six areas that are important for trial delivery. And I just want to point out to you that in each of the working groups, we have um, two um, either people with Parkinson's or some with Parkinson's and a care partner. So that the patient and care partner voice is 
absolutely critical and central um, to the decisions that are made. And we also have um, embedded within in each of the working groups um, and what's known as an early career researcher. So this is the next generation of clinical scientists, because what we hope that we'll achieve here is a platform trial that will run and run. This isn't going to be uh, a one stop wonder. Hopefully, as treatments come, come in and arms are discarded, that this will run. I think the um, prostate cancer trial has been running in excess of um, 15 years now. So it's succession planning is an important part of the process. And of course, we've got multi-professional experts to guide us. <coughs> so I'm just going to run through now the six working groups just to give you a flavour of what they're up to and the challenges that they're going to face. The patient um, engagement working group is chaired by Kevin McFarthing, whom some of you um, will know. Um, and what this working group um, does is it ensures that to each of those working groups that that patient and care partner voice is, is well heard uh, and listened to to really maximise the benefit of having that input. Um, and then part of what um, the group is going to do is ensure that there is awareness and understanding of the project amongst the Parkinson's community, both nationally and internationally. Uh, what we want to do as the sort of research delivery team is make sure that we evaluate how the, the, the person with Parkinson's voice and the care partner input, um, how that did result in impact and change um, to the project. The trial design working group is co-chaired by Professor Roger Barker and Professor James Carpenter. Um, uh, Roger, I'm sure a lot of you will realise, is a, an academic neurologist based at Cambridge, does a lot of work on stem cell uh, research, and James is a statistician uh, at the MRC CTU. Uh, and together they're going to be thinking about some of the design questions in our study. Which participants should we um, include? How do we um, distinguish a disease modifying effect from a symptomatic effect and by that I mean some treatments might benefit symptoms and if they benefit symptoms then how can you tell whether they're actually slowing disease progression and is it important to make that distinction. We've got access to various um, data sets that we can use to model our trial design so that hopefully we can choose the best one um, and of course the analysis will have to be very carefully planned. Just a bit now about the, um, the Delphi process findings on this. We asked people with Parkinson's and there's other stakeholders in the Delphi process who should be included in the study. And although there was consensus that the trial should not just be targeted at people who've not yet had treatment, there was no consensus about whether the trial should be as inclusive as, as, as possible, whether there should be an upper age limit or a lower age uh, limit or a disease duration. So you can see that there's a balance to be struck here between um, reducing variation in the study in the way that I talked about before, and in fact, the way that Lind achieved in his um, um, patient, his, his trial, but also making sure that any results from the study are as widely applicable as possible. So if we choose a very niche uh, selection of patients to trial a drug in, how do we know then whether it does have benefits in other, in other patients? The therapy selection working group is chaired by um, Professor Tony Shapira. Um, and this working group is charged with selecting the drugs to go into the trial, um, the number of arms, how many drugs should we test at, at each time point, what will that control arm look like, and how long will people be on treatment for? Um, and there are um, challenges around selecting the right drug for the trial. As I explained before, a lot of drug selection process might come from those early laboratory results in that preclinical phase. And the translation through from what works in animal models through to what works in humans doesn't really follow for neuroprotective drugs in the same way as it does for symptomatic drugs. So generally speaking, if about 80% of drugs um, work, or at least if about 80% of animal model studies have a positive effect for a symptomatic drug, then the chances are a similar percentage will be positive in, when the drug is finally trialled in humans. The same is not true for neuroprotective drugs. If it works in the animal models, that does not predict that it's going to work in people. So we're actually quite challenged as to how to select the best drugs. The other um, major challenge, which is a good problem to have, is that, of course, the number of drugs has increased exponentially as the drug discovery pipeline has got quicker and quicker. So in the old days, medicinal chemists would fiddle about at laboratory benches and make compounds with various bits attached to them to, you know, cross the blood-brain barrier and get to where they 
uh, needed to get to to do what they needed to do. Now you can do all of that using computer technology and design a drug very cleverly in silico, i.e. on a computer. Um, and and disc that whole drug discovery pipeline has, has condensed from 10 years to a matter of weeks in some cases. Um, so if you browse through the pharma pipeline web pages, you will see there are lots of drugs in the pipeline with potentially neuroprotective actions targeting very specific bits of where we think the biochemistry is going wrong in Parkinson's disease. So there's a massive number of potential agents to choose from. Uh, and so this group, the therapy selection group, will have its work cut out for it as to how to best achieve that. In terms of the number of arms uh, and what should be used as a control group, this was um, dealt with also in the Delphi process. And there was consensus that the drug, that the trial should be placebo controlled, i.e. that people should have um, a dummy drug to compare with. Uh, and of course, treat you have multiple arms, not just one drug, but several drugs to test at the same time in, in diff different arms. However, what wasn't um, where there was no consensus was whether a standard of care arm would be an appropriate control group. In terms of the duration, again, there's a balance to be struck. If you remember from the previous graph that I showed, the longer you run the trial, the more likely you are to find a difference between groups. But of course, what you want to do is get your answer as quickly as possible in the shortest amount of time. Um, but at the same time as getting the biggest possible um, difference. So actually there was no consensus here in the Delphi process about trial duration, whether the trial should, could take up to five years or whether a shorter trial would be acceptable. The next working group outcome measures is chaired by Professor um, Annette Schrag, um, who's done a lot of work uh, regarding outcome measures, uh, validating them, designing them, creating them, uh, and uh, for some time chaired the outcome measures um, uh, group within the Movement Disorder Society. And what Annette's group is going to be doing is, is thinking about what is the final outcome of the trial, which will show benefit for people with Parkinson's. Um, and this is what the regulators and the ethics committees want to know. They don't just want to know what, what what drug results in a better performance on a particular scale with tapping tests, they want to know, what does that matter? What does that mean for people with Parkinson's? What does that mean for us as a community trying to um, help people with Parkinson's and deliver better healthcare? Um, so it's important that we understand what those measures are and we don't understand those yet. So we need to work on that. And we also need some of those interim measures that will cull arms that aren't meeting that threshold. We don't know whether that should be a scan or maybe the tapping tests or maybe a blood test or urine test or spinal fluid test. There are all sorts of ways coming to the fore now of how we can get a, an idea of how one's Parkinson's is doing that might predict how you will be in several more years time in a way that really matters to you. So um, that's what underlies this statement here that we don't have a biomarker in Parkinson's. We've got nothing that we can measure objectively that predicts uh, how someone's Parkinson's is going to be. However, the Delphi process did show some positive findings with regard to consensus. So everyone agreed that actually overall, looking at the overall impact of the study, it's really important to understand how that impacts on someone's quality of life, their activities of daily living, maybe the development of new symptoms or developing milestones in the disease. We need to measure more than one thing to get a much more holistic assessment. Um, we like the idea of people being passively uh, monitored at home. So not a test that you have to do on a smartphone or a keyboard, but just something that measures you without you having to engage with it necessarily at home. Um, asking people to complete questionnaires. So we're getting some of those patient reported um, outcomes. Um, and interestingly, but only achieved consensus in the last round, an off-state motor assessment, which is of course the current gold standard that we ask people to come in off their medications and measure using our tapping tests and movement tests how they are. And when we think about these outcome measures, although all of this would be very nice to have, we have to be mindful of the burden to study participants. They don't need to spend their entire lives filling out questionnaires and coming to study visits. Uh, but we do need to make sure that our measures are comprehensive, that we're getting as much information as we can, <clears throat> particularly the information that matters um, to people with Parkinson's. And of course, off-state motor assessments are 
are challenging. We understand that um, they're challenging for the person uh, with Parkinson's and also challenging for their care partners who are living uh, their Parkinson's with them. There's also um, uh, challenge around using digital measures. So although we've said here about people being monitored passively at home, there's uh, any of you who've taken part in studies using a digital measure will understand that this is not without its challenges either. It sounds very much like a panacea, but it really isn't. Um, particularly at home measures, is there the connectivity there? Um, what, what is needed in terms of infrastructure, what is needed at site in order to, to receive those um, data, to process the data, uh, what happens if there's a, a bug in the software, what happens if the server crashes, what happens if the software provider goes out of business, um, <clears throat> all sorts of um, issues around the data standards and the metadata, uh, what, um, what are the conditions like when you're taking that measure at home. So digital, digital measures aren't without their challenges either. So this is a really important um, working group uh, with, with lots of unanswered questions. Uh, the infrastructure working group is um, chaired by uh, Dr. Stephen Mullen, who's a colleague of mine uh, here in Plymouth. Um, and what Stephen and his working group are going to achieve is to get everything ready in place so that when we have our first trial protocol written and funded by quarter one 2024 which is the current aspiration we'll have you know 50 sites across the uk ready to go with the infrastructure the workforce the training everything in place um, and an easy way for people with parkinson's to access that study through a research register uh, that we're hoping to set up and importantly uh, although I've added th this in <laughs> in preparation for the talk I think we also have work to do here collectively as a community uh, thinking back to my very first slide there is a culture of trial participation in clinical services that we need to embed this isn't just something that the other person does or that happens in the other place or that you may or may not have access to. This has to be absolutely part of our clinical care culture in the same way that it is now for a lot of cancers. That if you if you um, present with a particular cancer and you go to a, to a service, you almost expect to be offered the opportunity to participate in a trial that's going to drive forward that thinking and improve the care that you receive. Uh, just thinking a bit about the um, infrastructure, there was consensus that people wanted a combination of home-based and clinic visits. Uh, and of course, this is now um, not so far-fetched as it might have been um, a couple of years ago when people are very used to remote consultations, video consultations. And of course, it is perfectly reasonable, feasible, acceptable to conduct a research visit remotely. Um, particularly if it's uh, around gaining um, information about adverse events or side effects or something that doesn't actually require um, physical contact or blood tests, for example, to be taken. <clears throat> the uh, sixth working group is chaired by um, Joy Duffin, who um, works with Cure, Parkin for, with Cure Parkinson's. Uh, and Joy has... Uh, her, her working group has the uh, is charged with responsibility of overcoming these two uh, valleys of death here. So, <clears throat> uh, going back to what I was saying before, you have your basic research. This is done in in uh, laboratories, maybe those phase one studies, early human studies, and we want to conduct a phase two study. What we need, of course, uh, is money. We need funders, and we need um, once we've got our trial design, uh, we need resource to get that trial off the ground. We then undertake our study with our design and our outcome measures and everything that those other working groups have, have created for us. And hopefully we'll have a positive result to share. If that positive result lands nowhere, then we haven't really done our job. We need to make sure that we've built in those pathways to impact to make sure that any positive result quickly translates into treatment guidelines and benefits people with Parkinson's as quickly as possible. Um, so in this working group, um, Joy and her colleagues will be engaging with potential funders, regulators, uh, MHRA, um, which is the, the drug regulator for the UK, NICE, NHS England, charities. So stakeholder engagement is a really important piece of this particular jigsaw in order to get our project across the line where we hope it will be in a few years time. So I hope I've convinced you that our uh, EJS ACT-PD initiative covers all of these bases. Um, 
And if we go back to our um, trial design, our trial pathway and how clinical trials have developed since 1747, uh, the concept of randomization and double blind study and placebo control, um, those concepts uh, came into place in the 1900s. And since the turn of the century, we've really got better animal models with um, alpha-synuclein fibril formation, for example. Uh, as I said, we've got this really rapid drug development pipeline now based on artificial technology, artificial intelligence technologies. And what we hope to achieve is that over the next two or three years with this initiative for Parkinson's, we'll have an adaptive trial design, we'll have um, intelligence stratification, we'll have better outcome measures um, in order to deliver uh, what we want, the impact that we want uh, for people with Parkinson's. So I hope uh, that I'll be addressing Ben's um, comments here and that our system has changed. What will have changed is a system that was no longer slowing things down. And hopefully if there's a drug there to be found that will be helpful for Parkinson's, then we'll find it and at a pace uh, which does keep um, pace with uh, the neurodegeneration that people living with Parkinson's are experiencing. So I just want to finish by um, thanking you all for your attention. Uh, on this slide, I've listed some of our key stakeholders uh, and um, uh, members of our working groups, particularly colleagues from Parkinson's UK, Cure Parkinson's NIHR Clinical Research Network and the uh, Critical Path Parkinson's Consortium. Um, who are um, allowing us access to the data for modeling purposes. Uh, and I'm just going, I've got there on this, the slide, um, the link to a blog by Simon Stott, who works for Cure Parkinson's. I think you've heard him speak at Penprig before. Uh, and Simon writes wonderful blogs. And I think he has um, given a great description of our project, uh, probably in a, in a more um, intelligible, digestible way than I, just, <laughs> than I just have. So I think it's an excellent uh, blog. And, um, refer you to that uh, and I'd like to thank Marie um, who conducted the uh, Delphi project with her team. Thank you very much. All right, thank you uh, Camille. I think uh, you're right on time if not ahead of time so uh, we've got about 20 minutes for questions. Uh, if, if you want to maybe raise your hand or unmute yourself um, if you have a question or pop, pop them in the chat if you want to, so we can put them to Camille. I have a written question um, early on behalf of Mr. Hugh Johnston from Toronto in Canada. Uh, Camille, does the protocol allow for unblinded adaptation based on preliminary results to refine the target treatment group in brackets, i.e. not p-hacking, but focusing more on who a treatment might be for or might work for? Thanks, Hugh. Yes, that's, a, that's an excellent question and one that we have um, already deliberated um, and this is particularly pertinent for some of the therapies that we think will be possible to be targeted in a particular way so for example <clears throat> um, uh, one of the genetic predispositions towards developing parkinson's is the glucose cerebrosidase um, gene mutations or poly polymorphisms and there are therapies targeted at that particular biochemical pathway such as ambroxol uh, which is hoping to come through to clinical trial soon so if we have a therapy like that that we think will help people with a particular um, genetic predisposition or a particular type of parkinson's you're absolutely right there's two ways that we could approach that if we're very certain that we think we'll see a stronger signal in a particular type then we could um, build that into our inclusion criteria for that particular arm of the study. If we are not certain, then it starts to become a statistically uh, difficult question about enriching uh, or adapting those inclusion criteria after the trial has started. So probably the more robust way to do that would be to run the study and then have some planned subgroup analyses. And if you're getting a signal from planned subgroup analysis, then you would rerun the study um, powered sufficiently um, with that particular subgroup in mind. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. And within chat, we have a question from Graham Brown. Graham, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, what about uh, non-drug uh, therapies? I mean, we have some evidence that uh, exercise works for, you know, what's going on in the brain to improve, you know, uh, you know, Parkinson's symptoms and or to slow them down. 
No, that's again an, an, an excellent question. And I actually went through before the talk and changed the word drug to therapy for that exact reason. So you're right. When we think about neuroprotective interventions, we tend to think about drugs. But of course, it might be something that isn't a drug. It might be exercise. Uh, and there are studies already being undertaken to evaluate the potential protective effects of exercise. Um, so I think that's really important. And it's important that we keep an open mind. Um, the, the flip side of that particular coin um, is that we we need to be careful when we um, run our studies that we also take account of um, how much people are exercising uh, or uh, undertaking other activities which might also have a protective effect and we do this quite well with um, people's drug intakes so we ask people what other medications are you taking and we like those to remain the same or stable for the course of the study and we also would include um, these days supplements uh, and homeopathic remedies or anything that, that people are taking for that exact reason but we don't tend to ask people about their exercise habits so you're right as well as evaluating it as an intervention we also need to be mindful about um, keeping it in mind as a potential confounder that's great thank you very much okay, I, I wonder if i could uh, move the conversation uh, you know, the questions in a slightly different direction um, as an ex-marketing man um, I'm very sensitive to the word competition. Um, there, there's obviously a, uh, a situation, well, is there a situation here with suppliers in this sector, uh, uh, their reluctance to become involved in what it effectively is competition? Yeah, that's a very good question, Chris. Um, and the, the simple answer is that we're not comparing arms against each other, we're comparing each arm against placebo. So it's, it's multiple... Um, drug versus or therapy intervention versus placebo not not against each other um, for, for that partly for that reason is um, it, it, it's really important that we don't um, uh, put people off uh, in, investing um, and don't mean just mean by resource you know emotionally and intellectually investing in this process um, and and of course there are different drivers and different bits of the sector and it's really the, the pharmaceutical industry is really important here you know without the pharmaceutical industry we, we don't we won't have any drugs so it's important that the platform that we develop is attractive for them um, as a place to um, test their therapies in the future and throwing them into competition against their competitors would not be um, a, a, a sensible way to do that um, uh, but I should just preface that by saying uh, what we think that we're going to do um, in, the, in the first run is not um, attract commercial interest in this. It's likely that these will be academic studies through academic funders or charity funders evaluating um, either um, biotech um, drugs, but through an academic funding route or repurposed drugs like um, simvastatin, which was a trial that we, we finished not long ago, or exenatide, a diabetes drug, those sorts of drugs are likely to be the first therapies that we test in this platform. And then the idea, of course, is that it will be successful, um, both in terms of recruitment and delivery and all of the quality assurance around the delivery of the trial in order for it to then be attractive for pharmaceutical industries in, in the future. Thank you. That's great. Thank you to Graham and Chris and Camille on this one. Um, I've got a question in the chat box from Sue Webb. Sue, would you like to um, ask the question or shall I? No, oh, I'll ask it. <laughs> I'm not shy. Um, quite often people are put off joining a phase two study because they may get the placebo and it's perceived as the second rate. It, and uh, admittedly, the research is essential. But on a two-year placebo-controlled trial, it's deemed hard luck if you get on the placebo. What about this five years in the placebo arm? Will that deter people from joining the studies? Um, so a couple of points there. There's a lot wrapped up in that. So um, simple answer to the simple question. Yes, it might. And that's really why it's crucial that we have the voice of people with Parkinson's in the trial design. And if they say five years is completely unacceptable for this particular reason, three, three years is as far as we'll go, then we need to make sure that we have an outcome measure that can read out within that time frame. That's a very simple, simplistic way of answering that question. But wrapped up in there is the concept of what it means to be on placebo or indeed take part in a trial at all. And you have to remember, these are not proven therapies. 
They might do nothing. They might do harm. We don't know. That's why they're in a trial. So as well as taking uh, the potential benefit of being uh, on an active arm, there's also the potential risk. And of course, that's why fully informed consent is so important uh, and, and why all of those potential adverse effects, side effects, life threatening things that might happen uh, are really explicitly discussed when we ask people to sign up to studies. These are not without risk and these are unproven treatments. And uh, the other thing to say about that is that people who take part in studies, even if they are on the placebo arm, have better healthcare outcomes than those that don't take part in studies in the same way that um, services and healthcare organisations that are research active on the whole, people within those services will have better healthcare outcomes than those who, who are in services that aren't research active. Um, and there's, we don't exactly know what underlies that. It's likely to be um, the nature of the attention being paid to the person and or the underlying condition. Um, it, it might be to do with things being picked up uh, incidentally, because of course there's screening, just routine blood test and urine test screening that goes on, or it might be to do with the interaction with the um, research teams. And for those of you who've taken part in studies, you'll understand how important that is. You develop a really good interaction and, and support from the research delivery teams. And it might be that that's what results in, in better healthcare outcomes and, and well-being. Can I add something else to that? Um, I know it's not been, uh, it's not been designed yet, but I imagine somebody on the placebo having to do um, exercises which have not been proven to be neuroprotective, wear a patch just in case a patch is on a trial, have an injection in case an injection is on the trial. So uh -huh. will it be standard care for <coughs> everything? No, that, that's, that's another really excellent question. And uh, again, a simple answer to that is when we do our first trial, we just make sure it's that all of the therapies are one tablet once a day and that gets, that gets, <laughs> that gets over <laughs> that particular problem. But you're right, it's not a problem which is going to go away. So we have to think about how we address it. Um, and you can do multiple dummies, but of course, everyone would have to have the dummies for what they're not on. Um, so probably, an, or another solution, and this is all for statisticians to work out, but another solution is to randomise people first to the arm and then with each arm active versus placebo. So that if you are on an, if you're randomised to the injectable therapy arm, your placebo is the injectable therapy. Uh, it means that all of your placebo participants are on a different type of placebo. And of course, we don't know that an exercise placebo will have the same effect as an injectable placebo, but that's, as I say, that would be for the statisticians to work out. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Sue. I've run out of questions from the chat box. I'm going to hand back to Uli now to ask the floor if there's any further questions and maybe uh, close the session. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Nigel. Is, is there anybody else in the, in the audience who wants to raise a, raise a question? Just raise a, a hand or unmute yourself. I said, type it in the chat. Okay, if, if not, then uh, yeah, we'll bring the meeting to an end. Uh, all that remains for me is to, to thank all of you who made the time and took the effort to, to dial in and participate in the session. A big thank you to Camille uh, for presenting this and a thank you to the Penpick group who uh, uh, prepared and organized the session. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll bid you all goodbye and take care.